Hey kids! Do you like buzzwords and nonsense that sounds like substance? Well, have I got a treat for you. The Brown Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan is a pretty remarkable document. A pretty remarkable document. Well, that's a nice, vague, non-committal descriptor. It's both visionary and also very brass tacks and grounded with clear goals. Both visionary and brass tacks with clear goals. I have no idea what that is supposed to mean. But do those clear goals at all involve divvying people up by race? with intentional practices, with strategic check-in points to judge the quality of the success of different stages of it. Intentional practices and strategic check-in points by which you can judge the different stages of it. What is it? Well, diversity, presumably. So I'm very honored to help implement it in whatever ways I can as a faculty member to represent the intellectual legacies that support both the value of diversity and inclusion, um, but also show the impediments to creating a diverse and inclusive elite school, right? Right. These, these things are difficult to do. She's honored to represent the intellectual legacies that support the value of diversity and inclusion, but also to show the impediments to creating a diverse and elite school. So, she represents both the hope and the struggle all by herself. I guess? In order to understand why it's difficult, you have to really unpack the invisible practices that create the exclusions and non-diversity environments in the first place. The invisible practices, which, I can only assume, our speaker can somehow make manifest through her constituent intellectual legacies and non-diversity environments. See, I'm still not quite sure what our speaker's definition of diversity is. So, I wonder if she will clarify that for us. That's where things can get a little bit hairy for people, because they like to think that everything they do is entirely race-neutral, colorblind, and that they are operating on a system of meritocracy and that the cream rises to the top. Yes, they like to think that, and they like to believe that they operate on those principles. But anyone who says that they are colorblind and that they believe in meritocracy is obviously lying. Is that what I am to understand? So you find only white men rise to the top in the sciences then, I guess. Women don't rise to the top. Other domestic, particularly you know, historically underrepresented groups, don't rise to the top. It just, just happens. It is just, we're just the best, right? Right. Right. We're just the best. That is what all white men think of themselves simply because they are white men. And there are no people other than white men, in the upper echelons of the sciences. And anyone other than white men are actively denied such achievements because of a fraudulent meritocracy. Ergo, the sciences are all inherently racist and sexist and are in violation of federal civil rights laws. Got it. So, you know, how do you unpack that 
without having people feel like they're being accused of being discriminatory and to really explain that there's so much research that shows not just implicit bias but practices that produce social network cues that narrow the range say for hiring yes how do you accuse someone of being a racist and a sexist without directly accusing them of being a racist and a sexist? Why, by showing them various studies of questionable methodology, the conclusions of which, obviously, prove that the thoughts and motivations of any one individual are inherently morally bankrupt. Got it. Though, I have to wonder, if the studies show that we all unknowingly and invisibly behave like this, shouldn't our speaker's statements and motives be regarded with equitable suspicion? Um, evaluations that can be highly biased when it's women being evaluated in certain fields and non-whites being evaluated in others, most of them. Most of them? Not all of them? Why did you make that very hesitant exception? I mean, you seem to have allowed for the possibility that someone who is female and non-white might not be an inherent victim of career-stalling bias in academia, even though so many studies say otherwise. I... I wonder why that might be. And those kinds of practices that if we're really serious about bringing them to people's attention and having people take them seriously, then there's a chance here of really revising our practices, right? Right. And being aware that we're not actually in a race-neutral environment, that this is not a bubble. It's part of the regular world. All right, so you need to bring a stack of studies to an institution which tell everyone that, despite what they might believe or how they behave as individuals, that they are all actually contributing to invisible racist and sexist practices in education. And that even if they don't use race as a value factor in their daily lives, they now need to operate with an understanding that race is a value factor which they must take into account. Because race is a part of the regular world. Got it. We bring in those hierarchies and we reproduce them unless we work against them. We bring in those hierarchies and we reproduce them. We do this. We do. Says you. So what I love about our DAP is it has the potential to emphasize, again, climate, you know, actual hiring, uh, environment, discussions, you know, listening to various constituencies from students and staff, as well as faculty and administrators, and to really try to create an environment that is sustainably diverse and inclusive. Sustainably diverse, intentional practices. So. You sustain a diverse environment by weeding out people who you do not consider as being diverse and intentionally keeping them out? Is that what you mean? Because otherwise, I am not sure how else to interpret that. Do I think we'll be perfect at it? Not a chance. Do I think it'll be better than it was, say, when I got here a decade ago? It already is, and will definitely be better than that. I would really like to know how our speaker would define perfect when it comes to creating a diverse environment through policy and procedure at academic institutions. What does such a perfect population look like to her? I wonder. But we need everyone's support. To move the needle on some of this takes a tremendous amount of collective commitment. So everyone needs to be on board with your vision of a perfect diversity. Um, 
what happens to anyone who doesn't agree with you? I mean, I imagine they'll receive a packet of studies telling them that their opinion is invalid and that they are inherently a bad person. But what happens to them after that? So I'm really proud of the plan and I'm proud of the efforts that have gone un underway to, to actually implement it. I do see some real valuable change and so I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. Valuable change. Valuable change via thought policing and accusations of wrongdoing using invisible evidence. Valuable change via holding individuals to account for the questionable conclusions of research studies with an agenda. Valuable change via seeing a white man succeeding in the sciences as an inherent wrong, and that they have not reached such heights on the merit of their personal efforts, but were merely placed there as a result of racism and sexism. Yes, valuable change, by changing the value of a person away from the content of their character and instead focusing on the color of their skin. What a wonderful way to look at the world and at other people. Because that sort of change isn't just valuable, it's priceless. As always, thank you for watching.